we go. All right. So Christ and culture. How the two relate to each other. It's important, important subject. The classic book on this is written by H. Richard Niebuhr called Christ and Culture. I'm going to give you an overview of his five different models, some of which I understand and some of which I don't, but I'm going to, I'm going to use that as a basis just to get us started to think about how does our faith intersect with our culture. Um, so we're going to look at this, and then we're going to have you look at some Bible passages and think about how do those passages, what would they say about how we should be involved in our culture and in society, etc. It's a many, many-sided um, debate, and Christians throughout the centuries have come at this in some very different ways, and there's kind of an enduring problem. Um, and so I'm going to just give you some examples just to get your blood pumping and get you thinking about this. That, oh, I guess it is a challenge. How is it that our faith should interact with culture and, and whatnot? So, just heard just last night as I looked at one of my uh, friend's Facebook pages, and that friend is a bishop in the ELCA, that all 65 bishops um, signed and endorsed a letter um, celebrating President Obama's recent decision to, you know, with what he, his decision around immigration. So the, all 65 said that was a good thing. Interesting, okay? Um, you may be like, yay, or not sure, or whatever, but, but so here's a place where the bishops of our church joined together and got involved with how our faith relates to our government and to our culture. So that was, that was an example of something. Barb, question? I was going to quote Jeremiah. Okay, right. Take, how do you take care of the alien? And stuff? Like we have today, okay? But others might quote that in a different way. So I'm, I'm bringing those up to get you, get you wrestling here. Um, if, you, if you didn't know, quite a while back, um, Jimmy Carter wrote a big, long, scathing critique of the evangelical churches. He, he, he wrote it against them because he felt that they had gotten in bed with the Republican Party. They were equated with them. And he wrote his long thing. So he was crit criticizing how evangelicals were being political. Um, I think one might say, even though he didn't write it the other way, that a lot of mainline churches probably could be criticized for being... <laughs> completely on board with maybe a Democratic um, view of politics. Um, Quakers. How many know about Quakers and Mennonite traditions? And, and they're pacifists. They don't go to war. So the way they felt their faith should interact with... Well, I'm sorry. I know I'm a citizen of this country, but I don't go to war. That's my faith says no. Other Christians, obviously, have been going to war and fighting for their country for centuries, and they've not seen a conflict, or, or maybe there was a tension and a struggle, but they, they felt they would go ahead and do that. Um, I've often heard uh, um, Christians say that the church is being dictated by the culture. And they would say, no, the church should dictate to the culture, not the other way around. And sometimes this comes up around issues like maybe abortion or um, all kinds of things. I've actually heard, I've had pastors on both ends of the political spectrum, or the we'll use the, the mis... Well, that may be unhelpful liberal and conservative categories. I've had really conservative pastors get right in my face and say, Pastor Bill, the fact that you're not talking about abortion every Sunday and how evil it is, is you are not being faithful to your call. I've had liberal, very liberal Christian pastors in my face saying, the fact that you're not supporting publicly gay marriage every Sunday from the pulpit and that you're not railing against this, you're not keeping your call as a pastor. How does our faith 
intersect with culture and just our daily life, let alone our political life, is a huge enduring struggle. And Christians have come at this in all kinds of different ways. One of my, um, well, how many remember Jerry Falwell? Okay, the moral majority. This is a movement where both political and social, of we're going to give morals, certain morals anyway, a certain viewpoint of morals, into the public life. But we think about, so I, went, I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Here's a Christian pastor who is preaching the gospel and preaching, and he looks, and many other people, um, he kind of actually, if you know his story, he got, it wasn't like he said, oh, I'm going to fight for civil rights one day. He kind of got swept right up into it. That's usually the way the cross grabs us. Um, and so he got involved, and he brought biblical truths to what he saw going on around in society. If you look at some of his great speeches, he's oftentimes quoting Old Testament prophets um, about justice and let justice roll down like waters, right? So, um, so here's, here's a, a movement that's very Christian in its orientation. In the African American community, it's not uncommon, I've been told, I don't know, um, in a lot of churches to go and they talk about politics very openly. Some, not all. Whereas, whereas usually when I'm here, and in our churches, we'll say, keep politics out of church, Pastor, right? And actually, I kind of agree with that. But um, that's, that's, you know, we, we have different views of that because we have different ways that we think about how does Christ interact with our culture. Um, and so I know I've mentioned some political examples, but, but we could make examples of more um, how we worship. Some of the evangelical big box churches that tend to be more conservative politically, who are always saying, you know, don't let culture dictate to you your morals and, you know, whether it's about whatever it's about. I, but when I look at their worship, I go, man, you've just totally accommodated to culture. I mean, you've made worship easy and simple and entertaining, which is cool. That's fine. You're preaching the gospel. But that's culture. I mean, that's a... That's a culture accommodation. So anytime we think that, oh no, we're going to stand apart, it's a lot more complicated. Okay? So now, have I stirred the waters sufficiently? Okay, good. All right. Let's just go home. <laughs> so H. Richard Nieb Niebuhr um, has written this book that I mentioned, and there are five ways that he talks that, that Christians have looked at their culture. And the first way he mentions is called Christ against culture. In other words, culture is evil, and you have, to, you have to get together in your community, and you are against what's going on in culture. Think of the first century Christians in Rome. Um, you're gonna, some of you are going to study some passages, but how is it that According to the Gospel of John, people are going to know we're Jesus' disciples. How many of you remember? How is it they're going to know that we're Jesus' disciples in the Gospel of John? By your love. By your love. For who? For each other. See, John's, you guys get together and you love each other. The world's going to look on and say, wow, they're followers of Jesus. But he's not talking about loving the world yet, because the world is bad. We're against the world. We're, we're opposed to the world, and we're going to separate ourselves from the world. A lot of Christians throughout history have withdrawn from culture. Um, the problem, of course, and Niebuhr will mention this, is just when you think you've separated yourself, the culture sneaks in there. That, it's, that you can never do that completely. And then, of course, what's the other critique? Shouldn't Christians influence the culture? See, but this is a stance, Christ against culture. It's bad. Think about the book of Revelation. The world, um, it's bad, you know, it's, you're being oppressed, you're being persecuted, so you withdraw, the world is bad, you be faithful, you're against the culture. So that's one way Christians have operated. Another way, on the total other side, is what he would call Christ of culture. Whatever the cultural 
um, hero, the, you know, the, what the, that culture values the most, oftentimes Christ starts looking like that. Like if a rational, um, you know, intellectual human being in the Greek culture, um, if knowledge and this, you know, all of, all of this kind of um, super intelligence and secret knowledge and, and rationality and logic, if that's, that's what the culture esteems the most, Christ starts looking like that. So you have the Gnostic religions in the first century where Jesus was a teacher of only knowledge and just... So, so it can go the other way. Christ against culture is one thing, but, but, but many times we see in culture that Jesus starts looking like whatever that culture values the most. I'll give you an example. I could be wrong on a lot of these examples, okay? But the Jesus Seminar, which I've talked to you a lot about over the years, um, Marcus Borg, others, um, John Dominic Crisson, um, when I look at the Jesus that they've gone and sorted out from the four Gospels, you know, this, these passages aren't real and these aren't, but this one probably he really did say, they come up with the Jesus that they want. A very enlightened, liberal, um, caring, social kind of Messiah. See? So is that, you know, is that what the Bible says? Is that the culture kind of creating Christ? You decide. But um, this is the type of thing. So you might say this is accommodating Christianity to society. And we can say, oh, that shouldn't happen. But you know what? It happens. And, it, and, we, and probably in ways that we haven't um, always been aware of. Christ above culture. This is the church in the middle. This is the church tries to, um, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting, he comes up with some really interesting examples, but, but he doesn't want to say that the, that the church is there to um, change the culture, but it's there to be a mediator and integrate. Um, and so maybe this is a fine point but it's somewhere in between against culture and of culture. <laughs> it, the church kind of floats above culture and um, tries to mediate between Christ and the, and, and the culture. Um, we'll, we'll maybe come back to that one. Christ and the culture in paradox. This is a hard one, but most people think Martin Luther was in this camp. Luther said that there were two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Christ, which he would call the right-hand kingdom. And that kingdom is one of forgiveness and grace and mercy. That's one where you, you know, somebody takes, wants your coat, you give them the other one, too. Um, you turn the cheek. You know, you, um, you do the Sermon on the Mount. That's the kingdom of Christ. It's forgiveness, it's grace, it's mercy. But that's a kingdom. What did... Pilate, when he was getting on Jesus' case, what did Jesus say to him? You know, my kingdom is not of this world. So, Luther, now the Christ against culture world, folks would say, see, Jesus wanted this separate little kingdom and it was against culture. Luther's going to say, no, Jesus' kingdom is one thing, and then you have the civil world. That's the left-handed kingdom of God. you got the right-hand kingdom and the left-handed kingdom, and this kingdom has rulers and laws and policemen and police women and um, mores and structure and um, and those rulers have been put there those leaders have been put there to keep order in society this this kingdom is all about law and order <laughs> not the not the show law and order but the you know what taxes taxes yes <laughs> Think, what did Jesus say? Give unto Caesar. Caesar what is Caesar's, one kingdom, and to God what is God's. Now that's the way Luther would look at that. Other Christians would interpret that a little differently. Um, so, so what Luther would say is that the two are, they're both true, but they sometimes contradict each other. That's what a paradox is, right? Two truths that seem to contradict each other. So, so Luther then would say, he could say things like, you know, take care of the peasants and all of this. 
um, and be, he to, you know, talk about how Christ was for them and he was with them and the peasants loved him. But then all of a sudden when they revolted and, and started, you know, looting and going crazy and anarchy, Luther said some really, we wish he wouldn't have said things. Like princes, do your duty. How could he say both things? Well, there are two kingdoms. And he felt the peasants in his day had totally crossed the line. Now others, other Christians who followed Luther encouraged those peasants to revolt because they felt that's the way Christ should, you know. Now, I, that's, you know, Luther said many things that we like, oh, he was certainly a sinner, you know. He's no, he's no, he's not our savior, Jesus is, you know. And that's one of those that's an embarrassment to us, just in the severity of what he said, and you don't even have to go look and read it, you just take my word for it. Um, but, but I want, but it's helpful because at least you can see where he's coming from. Now, with Luther, what's the critique of this Christ in culture and paradox? The critique is, you have no critique of culture by Christianity over here. And Luther would say, no, that's not true. Even though they're in paradox, you take your Christian values and you do, you know, call for justice. And you do work, but you, you have to do it within the system. So in our democracy... You go to the voting booth. You don't rise up in anarchy. See? You, you elect people and you, you peacefully protest. You, keep, you do it within the law. That's, that's kind of what Luther would say. But again, the critique would be, what happens if those laws are just so absolutely corrupt? You can't even, you know, keep them. And I think of the civil rights movement in some degree. I think Luther would probably say at that point, well, you ultimately, your ultimate allegiance is God. So what would you say, what would Luther say if if this culture over here, the left-hand kingdom, was saying something that you know you can't worship, you can't believe? Well, this trumps. He would say that. This trumps. Um, yeah, so Christ in culture and paradox. It's a little more tricky, but this is another way that Christians have come at. The, the question. Um, oh, I lost my transform slide. There's another slide I had up here, and that's Christ, the transformer of culture. And these are Christians who believe that these Christian values should be out there in the public world, and we should transform culture. And most of us probably wouldn't disagree with that. We might disagree with what those values should be. For instance, Jerry Fall would say, absolutely, he's a Christ transformed culture. Um, Jimmy Carter would say, absolutely, Christ transformed culture, but they're very different in what, how they view Christ. Um, it's interesting, I'm going to say Martin Luther King Jr. was, I don't think he was trying to make society Christian, but he was trying to make it just. I think there's a little bit of a difference there, but I'll let you kind of play with that. Whereas Jerry Falwell, I think, was like, he wanted to, you know, this is a Christian nation, let's make it Christian again. Um, and, and I think there's a, a little bit of a difference there. So, so there you go. There's some models. If you want to read, the, it's a very tough read, by the way. I went and tried it. I read it again, and I go, whoa. <laughs> but, but that's enough to it's get awesome. you, that's Thank one you. way to think, how does Christ influence culture? Every individual and their values and how they live their every second daily life. That could change culture in a big way, right? Yeah, excellent. Other, any, anything else you want to throw on? Her? Okay, yeah, sure. You know, sometimes, uh, if you really read this, it's loving each other within a Christian community. Yes. Which is not always easy, because right. we're always sinners. We right. We always have differences of opinions. Yes. But the overriding factor is we have one that loves each of us. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Excellent. All right, good. Um, let's keep rolling here. Um, let's go on to, um, did we do this one, John 1, 2? This is kind of more of... A similar to, to what we just heard from John 13, um, but this is, uh, um, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. So it's not just what you say, but it's what you do. Whoever loves his brother um, abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother in this darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going, 
because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Who, did anybody have this passage? I think I put it out in the back. Do you want to, any, anything, what came up? Or, they're, 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 they're pointing to you, Doug, so you got it. Yes. Oh, boy. Yeah, me. Okay. Well, we talked about that, and we said, well, that's kind of hard to do sometimes. It's, um, it's not always easy to to love every brother. Right. And, you know, how, how do we do that? Right. So, right. But, so the, just the tension, the struggle, the overwhelmingness of doing this is... Yeah, right? yeah, good, so, good. That's probably enough. Good question. It's not easy. Excellent. All right, let's keep rolling. Um, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is, if it were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Who had this one? Who's going to tell us the definitive truth of what this says? <laughs> um, what came up, Greg? You looks like you got a, got the nod. Well, we. Uh... Um, harken back to the one about the paradox of the two kingdoms. Okay. And we talked about that, um, I don't know, maybe Pilate was trying to provoke Jesus because he might have been expecting Jesus' followers to be like those, you know, wild-eyed Zelotes or right. the uh, Maccabeans. Right. right. And so I think Pilate was kind of frustrated, or maybe he was expecting that. Interesting. But Jesus was like, you know, no, it's, we're... My kingdom is a kingdom of peace. And that's why Pilate was like, well, I don't have any civil, he hasn't broken any civil laws. Right. So, yes. that was a, that's fascinating. You, you really get me thinking about um, some of the nonviolent movements that have made such a difference in the world. Well, and, you know, just one on that, Nonviolence only works in a, a civil society. You know, if Mahatma Gandhi was able to do what he did in India because of British laws, right? Okay. If, Mahatma, if Mahatma Gandhi had tried the same tactics in Nazi Germany, he'd have been dead. Yeah. Great so it point. depends on the society too. Great point. Good, 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 good. So if there was not a civil government of, that had some just law. Then At least some, of that, of just some, some, some of that couldn't have happened. Interesting. Really good. All right, good. Anything else on that one? We could, we could spend the whole time just on that passage, but I want to get us a real great, um, uh, um, you know, overview here. Romans 13. You guys ever read Romans 13? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. How do you think that went over with some of those early Christians who were getting beaten up by the Romans? But Paul says this, interesting. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Okay, now there's, Greg, your comment. The assumption that Paul has is that rulers in the left-hand kingdom are going to be just. He's, that's the, he's going on that assumption. Now the question comes is what happens when that's not true? That's a whole other thing. But do you wish to have no fear of authorities? Um, then do what is good and you will receive its approval for it's God's servant for your good. <laughs> what do you think about this? I mean, and all, all I don't mean to laugh about it. It's just, um, it's a challenge. How does that hit to some of our current events in Ferguson? You know, it, it's, that's a real tough one, isn't it? Um, but if you do what's wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due to them, taxes to taxes are due, revenue to revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. 
Boy, the Apostle Paul is just putting a word in for the man here, isn't he? <laughs> for the establishment. You think he was doing that under duress while he was in prison? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a great comment. And what I want to say about that is let's put this in context. What was the biggest possible problem for the beginning of Christianity? That the government was going to see this as a subversive movement against Rome. Because what was it? A Jewish sect. That's the way they viewed it. So Paul says, you know what, Christians? You'll be the best citizens there are. And you'll show them. And, and what happened? Eventually, Rome becomes what? Christian. Because, you know what? Christians respect authority. And they actually obey the laws. And they work hard. You know? But the, we got to put it in that context. Was that the transformer model? The tra I think it would be a little bit. I, I want to say it's the, the, the in paradox. You know, Christians have their values. But then over here, we live out justly. We don't try and make it cr Christian, but we're good citizens of the, of the other kingdom. See, we live in both kingdoms. But it could, you could look at the transform. That This is the way you transform society. By Christians in the parking lot, loving each other, doing it. And people go, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. I think this is happening in China. I really do. I, I, you listen to what's going on in China. Um, you know who's getting the wealthiest in China? Christians. The old Protestant work ethic is at work. Uh, this is NPR, no? A, 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 a show I heard on NPR not uh, a couple years ago, but the, the fastest growing, at least at the time from this story, if is, is Christ, the fastest growing wealth as far as China goes are Christians because they're like, <laughs> you know, it's, but again, there's there's dark sides to all of this. There's dark sides to all of this. I mean, what, if you read this to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, yeah. who was in Nazi Germany, you know what? You, you know what Dietrich did? You know what he said? He said, you know what? By plotting to kill Hitler, which he did, he believed he was under God's judgment because because murder's wrong. But he felt he'd be under greater judgment if he didn't do anything because Hitler was, you know, this evil, evil force. So, so he that's that's how he worked through that. So, um, again, the assumption up here with Romans is that governing authorities are doing what they should be doing. So, yes, yes, please. Well, I'm kind of looking at that ending on our due, D-U-E. Ah. And in Rome's situation, uh, certainly the ordinary citizen did not question the history. Here, in our current society, everybody gets to define who owes who, what to who. And yeah. there, there is the rub. Yes. Um, because if we go to our political parties and look at their labels, they'll, they'll tell us. Who's do what? And the media will tell us. And then they put four or five people on all at once, all screaming at each other, trying to tell us. <laughs> and that and, makes uh, it, that helps a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> it helps. Yeah. So I think it, it comes down to acceptance of of the authority and respect for the <laughs> systems and right. laws. Those are fabulous. Those right. are ordained by God. Right. But how we are going to apply it is yeah. all over the map. Right. So that's a very helpful comment. Very good. Very good. Terry, we got Terry back here. Um, and someone, okay. Don, Don you want right here? Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, we'll this is the, this is a powerful passage here, tough one. So then we'll be good. Please. Can I go back to um, something previous that yes, we discussed? Yes, you can. When we were talking about how do we treat brothers who maybe we don't see eye to eye or right. we're not in agreement or we don't like the agreement. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, for me, the thing that just keeps coming up, because I keep looking at that love for one another, and yeah. the thing that just keeps coming up for me is that do no malice. I don't right. have to agree with them. Right. But I don't have to go out of my way to hurt them. Right. And maybe if I'm in a situation where I hear them being generalized and stereotyped, 
maybe I can be a quiet voice to speak up and say, well, maybe not all, yes. maybe not everybody. I, I, I don't think we all have to really like each other, but just, we don't have to like yeah. each other. Either. Very, very well said. I'm thinking about Romans 12, where Paul, I didn't put it up here, I don't think. Um, you know, don't return evil for evil. And then Paul says, inasmuch as it depends on you, live at peace with each other. Romans 12, take it, check it out. Powerful. Because sometimes you can't do anything about it. But inasmuch as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. Don't return evil for evil. You know, you don't have to be best friends. But <laughs> um, I, By the way, thank you, Terry, for taking us back there real quick. My campus pastor uh, at Cal Lutheran was the best model for loving. He said... It's about making space for someone. They don't have to be your best friend, but can you make space for them? Because they're a cinder broken person just like you. Can we make space for them? It, interesting. Good. Good. Hey, let's um let's what about you who had Micah six? Hey, sorry, choir members, I guess you gotta scoop to practice. Um, what about Micah six eight? Who had that one? Please. What what is that? Did it, what came up? Or do you wanna share it all? Uh, no, a couple of things. Came yeah. Up. Uh, what uh, different translations uh, might be a little bit different? Instead of love kindness, uh, the NIV says uh, to love mercy. Ah, and, good. Uh, in looking at this, one of the comments uh, that was made was that doing justice is sometimes tricky. Trying to figure out what is just, uh, loving kindness or mercy, that's a little bit easier. Mm. First, I think to discern. And then uh, on the uh, to walk humbly. One point was made, uh, particularly from a Christian standpoint, uh, and Paul is really, really strong on this, that since our salvation is totally dependent on the gift yes. from God and Christ, right. we, we've got to be humble. Yes. Nothing that we do has anything to do with uh, yeah. our, our salvation. Yeah. The gospel humbles you, if yes. you get it, right? So, yes. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and, yeah. and also... Um, in the NIV study Bible, it uh, suggested going back to uh, Deuteronomy uh, 10, 12 and 13. And it's a little bit more expansive on, on the issues. So let me read that. Yeah. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve uh, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's command and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Yeah. Yeah. It expands, yeah, it expands it. Yeah. I, I really think this passage is huge because this passage is the credo passage for a lot of Christians and how they live in the world. Do justice. Now this is that, that word, um, uh, mishpat in Hebrew. It's not the not righteousness word, but do justice. Love, and by the way, this word for kindness is chesed, which is the, the loving kindness of God. It's this, like, if you know, like uh, unconditional love or, you know, never-ending love, steadfast love. It, um, so love that and walk humbly with your God. So what does it mean to do justice in the world today? Can anybody just sum that up for me? <laughs> oh, Bruce, you're going to try. All right. We well, gotta... I'm going to refer to another sermon I heard that I, just, I wanted to look for the opportunity to throw this in because I just love it. All right, throw it I in. A, I heard a sermon about the... Uh... The attitudes. Yes. And the, the pastor's point was Jesus didn't say peacekeepers. He said peacemakers. Mm. And there's a big difference there. Yes. Okay. Because peacekeepers just try to keep the status quo. Right. Where this lends itself to justice. Yeah. A.K.A. Bonhoeffer. Okay, right. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer did what he did looking for justice. I And, and what does it mean to keep, to, to make peace in the world today? In our personal lives, in our corporate community lives, um, how do we do that? Let me tell you, I think that this is um, a really tricky one. And and maybe it makes me a fence walker, you know, because I just, you know, love walking the fence. It's actually painful if you've ever tried it. But um, 
uh, this is when I, the bishops of the ELCA who voted to approve and celebrate what President Obama did recently regarding immigration, absolutely point to this. We are doing justice. This is why we're supporting the president doing it. Other Christians would say, you're actually doing more harm than good, and you're not doing justice. You're, you're celebrating breaking the law, or whatever. Uh, this is the thing that we just have to live in tension with, and dialogue with, and agree to disagree with, and then go out there and do our best, and work for justice. I think the struggle I have, if I have a struggle, um, because I love the fact that our church is in the world, but I get over and over, you know, we've got to be a public church, public church, go to the ELCA's website. <laughs> um, advocacy, advocacy, this and that. But it is, let's face it, a particular way of looking at justice. There are different visions and different ways to go about justice. Um, and I'm not going to solve that, obviously, for you. But I just want you to know this is a tension, this is a struggle. How does Christ interact with culture? The word justice stands right in the middle. What does it mean to be just in the world? I like to think justice is equal opportunity, but not equality. Is equality always just? Well, see, there you go. See, that's where you get into the, the debate and the struggle. But, but I think that word justice, mishpat in Hebrew, stands between Christ and culture. And, and we're called to live for justice, but how we do that is going to differ. Um, you're going to go in the voting booth and vote differently. Some of you are going to be on the Republican Party platform, and some the Democrat, some the Libertarian, and some the Green Party, I guess, and I don't know, whatever other parties there are politically, but then you're going to do that, you know, gosh, come to our house after the news. It's not pretty. No, it's, you know. So anyway, so we, I live this out in my household, okay? So, so anyway, and we do as the church, but the, I think we have to be, let me just say it this way, I think we have to be careful as the church because if we decide one way, what is that, where does that leave the other side? But yet, don't we have to sometimes act? So, I don't know. I mean, here's a little quick one. When I came, I went to El Salvador um, when, I, in, when I was going to seminary, and I got to know the Lutheran Church there a little bit, and at the time there was a civil war going on between the FMLN, which was a communist kind of socialist group, and the government. Our government was supporting the, the El Salvadoran government, these certain number of families, who were doing horrible things to people. But on the other side, you got the socialist communist movement, um, and then you got the peasants and the people in between. And so what I did is I went to El Salvador because these people were forced into San Salvador, the city, because there was a civil war going on, but the government was get, not getting them any money or any help or any food, and so they were starving in El San Salvador. So, so there was a movement that the Lutheran Church was working with, Christ and culture, to get to repopulate the countryside. They, these people had to go back and start planting and cooking. Now the government was saying, oh, that's a communist thing. But they're just like, we just got to survive. So what they did is, as Americans, because we were supporting the El Salvadoran government, um, I, my mom didn't know I was doing this at the time, I'm glad, um, but I, um, I went down to San Salvador to get on the buses with people who were repopulating the countryside because the Salvadoran military would never hurt an American because that's what was sending them all their money. And so, so I was like, that's what I was doing as Christ in culture. I mean, but it was a... Talk about a complex, I don't know what the right answer is and stuff, but I went there. So I got to know the Lutheran Church in El Salvador, and um, Bishop Gomez, I think, was the bishop at the time, and I got back my first call in Lodi, and I heard that he had been thrown in jail. Mm. So I was like, man, we got to do something about it. So I put in the narthex um, a table with people who could sign a letter, you know, and the senior pastor at the time, who I won't mention, said, no, we're not doing that. That's crossing the line. And in retrospect, but see, I, I must just love to create problems and not solve them for you. you know? I, mean, I mean, that's kind of where we're at. I, we're, we're getting close on time and we didn't get to all the passages, but is there anybody who, um, so, you know, some of the Paul passages, that, that you, there was something that happened in your small group that you want to to get out. Um, anybody, any of the other groups that didn't get a chance to talk yet, like, you know, this passage, we had the Romans passage or the 
the, uh, um, the let's see, what was it? Uh, First Thessalonians was back here somewhere. There it is. Um, we appeal to you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and have charge over you. The Lord admonish you, esteem them very highly, etc. Any any other flames that came up? I want to I want to make sure not miss anything. Yeah, please. First Thessalonians, be kind to each other. So he's talking about Paul speaking to the, the people in the church. Right. Be kind to each other and to everyone else. Yes. Oh, there you go. So it isn't here. Here, it's not just the in, but it's also the out. So a bringing together. That's good. Awesome. Anything else? Please, Tish, right there. Yeah. And, then, and then, Jason, can you come up to the, the statement? Yeah. So ours was um, Matthew 5, 14. And it says we are to be the light of the world. Yes. So, um, so all can see our good deeds and praise God. Uh-huh. So... That's another way, so the Christ in culture, how do we be a light to the world? For those who say Christ is just against culture and we're just going to get in our own little group and, and forget this evil society, Jesus says we're supposed to be a light to the world. So, so we we got to engage somehow, right? Yes. So we have the parable of the Good Samaritan. Oh, good, yes. And so... Um, in reading this, you know, the three people, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, yes. was beaten. And, of course, the uh, Levite walked on by. Right. He didn't want to get dirty. Yeah. And the priest, I mean, the priest didn't want to get dirty. And the Levite, because he was hated the Samaritan. Right. And so the question was, like, like what uh, I'm reminded of what Barbara said. Yeah. Thessalonians, because the question is, who's my neighbor? Yeah. You know, you have to. Right. And it's everyone. Yes. Right. You can't be selected. Right. So that drives us. to Jesus. Yes. It drives us out into the world, doesn't it? Yeah. And who, who proved, notice what Jesus, how he turns that parable. It starts with, who's my neighbor? And Jesus asks at the end, what does he ask? Who was neighbor? And, you know, so it, that's a, a powerful text. Um, were you going to say more, Joyce, on that? Oh, just the, end, the, one, uh, the teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. Yes. Jesus replied, you go then and do the same. Yeah, there you go. Get out there. Um, we've got Audrey over here. Um, oh, yeah, let's we'll go to Audrey and then, thank you, that's excellent. I, want to, I didn't want to miss these passages, so thank you for, yeah. This is kind of reflecting on what uh, the first group up here said about love. I love your neighbor. And I think if we, sometimes that word love is so overused yes. and generalized that if we substitute kindness, neighborliness, respectfulness, words like that, I think that we would... We can look at other people differently, yes, and even see some of ourselves in some of those people also that Absolutely. we may not want to be friends, yeah. But we find out we're just like they are. Yeah, we we had a passage over here, I think, that uh, the sheep and the goats, right? In as much as you've done it to the least of these, wait, chime in here, and then we'll. Uh, so, uh, Just quickly to build on, on that, yeah. because as I was going through this, uh, I think it's very important to have a working, actionable definition of love. Yeah. You know, uh, to, to say, even even to, to, to equate that to kindness, for me, love, loving my neighbor, loving my brother, is a willingness to do things for them. So I, I try to make it so it's actionable. Okay. Uh, because Good. I agree, the word love is, is can be... You know, I, oh, I, I love them. Okay, well, what do you do for them? Yeah. Well, is it a feeling? Is it an action? Yeah. 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 So for me, I think it has to be an actual definition of love. Excellent. Now, let me just throw on a little bit of an interesting dynamic. And this is where we have to discern. <clears throat> have you, any of you ever heard of codependency? <laughs> What's the concept? Well, in an alcoholic home, <clears throat> I'm married to an alcoholic. They come home drunk. I keep taking care of them. I love them. So I keep doing stuff for them. Am 
Am I loving them? So sometimes helping is hurting. So see, what does it mean to love? We've got to come at this with some, some real depth of thought. How do we love, love our neighbor? Yes, Sherry. Please. My, I was told love is wanting the best for the other person. Oh, what is say, say that. That's good. Love is wanting what is best for the other person. So with the alcoholic right. right. that's not the best. That's right. Right. Good. 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 Okay, so let me sew this up this way. The Christ and the culture interaction and debate is complex. And it's one we just live with lots of tension. There's no doubt we're called into the world. We're also called not to be of the world. Um, we have the kingdom of Christ, and, and then we go out into the world, and how do we live that kingdom of Christ in the world is a question Christians have been struggling with from the beginning. There's no way that we could idealistically say, oh, I'm not going to let culture influence me. We're people of this culture. In fact, this newsletter article I got about cremation says, the title is, Cremation Grows Churches Accommodate. So, well, is that our culture kind of? Well, there's always an interaction. But what do we do? In my mind, and this is where I want to end, is we go back to our scriptures and we say, okay, now the culture, this is happening in our culture. Let's go back. Now, how does this, how do we look at our sacred text, you know, that we say is the source and norm for our faith and life? And we say, okay, how does this work? Sometimes we'll go to those scriptures and say, we can't do it. Sometimes we'll go, okay, cremation, oh, that's okay. Oh, some Christians in the past thought no, but, but now we look at our scriptures and we go, we can square this, or we can't, but, but that's the debate. A lot of people, let's take the leadership of women, I've got to finish here, um, I won't get this done in 30 seconds, but they said, hey, church, you're just accommodating to what's going on in the culture. And I'm going to say, absolutely, you're right. But, when we went back to our scriptures, we looked at the many places women are leaders in scripture. In Paul's letters, in the way Jesus treated women, and we go, oh, actually we may have been missing the mark on this. But again, it's that, it's that we go back to the source and norm for our faith and life and we wrestle with. So that's the dialogue. This is going on in our culture, but this, what does our scripture say? And then it's a, then it's a conversation. Do you see how that works? And, and Christians come out in different places. Okay, this has been fun. Awesome. Next week, we probably won't have it. It's Thanksgiving weekend. Blessed Thanksgiving to all of you. Um, but then the week after that, we're going to come in and we're going to study. We're going to do some stuff on the Gospel of Matthew, like three sessions to get you ready because we're going to really be pouring into Matthew now in our narrative lectionary. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you.